virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity i'm a soldier for christ i'm a soldier for christ i'm a soldier no they'll never take us under because we're bringing truth like thunder Raining on your speakers like a ton of bricks Hold the cross high cause we'll cap those licks Fight the good fight with the truth Stand tall with the truth I'm a warrior for Christ I'm in love with the truth Love God, save souls, slay error Go stronger Holy hour of power Two Catholics that are reporting for duty, sir Amen, brother. Absolutely. We're 10 8. This is the Holy Hour of Power. <laughs> High Energy Catholic Radio. And uh, this is where Catholicism and culture intersect. Terry. Hey, brother. How are I, you, my friend? I'm blessed because I heard the good news about Bishop Sheen's beatification. And after we do uh, the gospel, I want to share a few words about that. Uh, it's exciting news. But as we say here on Virgin Most Powerful, Charity with Clarity. And we always preach the word of God because we're evangelists, okay? We want to give you the good news of Jesus. And there's no better way than to open up your Bible. Every single day we do the readings of Holy Mass. It's chapter 18 of, of St. Luke's uh, Bible uh, Gospel. It's verse 1 through 8. And I think this is another uh, gospel that just hits you right between the eyes. So, Jess, could you be so kind to read the good news of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke? Soul food on the line. Got it. Here it goes. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, Holy Mass today. And it reads, He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was. I love that. Sought to see who Jesus was. Yeah. But could not on account of the crowd, because he was small of stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up on a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, so I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, He is gone in the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded any of any one of uh, any one of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. He is also a son of Abraham. Mm. Verse 10. This is the meat of it. Yeah. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Praise Lord, to you Jesus Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. That's the meat of it. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That's what St. Luke depicts him as, the Savior of the human race. He came to save Jew and Gentile. You see that Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham. He was a true descendant, but he was also a true descendant by faith and by repentance because that's what's more important to God versus bloodline. And we also see that he was so moved by Jesus' presence that he said that whatever I've defrauded people, I'll, I'll give it to them back fourfold. That, that's a, a, a verse in Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, that if you take from somebody else, Exodus requires you to give back fourfold. That's to make sure that you have a true sign of repentance. And uh, Zacchaeus was a rich guy. He was a rich a tax collector. But uh, once he converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, he became very generous to the poor. And, uh, and and Zacchaeus, he basically knew who he was looking at. He was looking at the Messiah, the Son of God. Terry? Well said, Jesse. I have nothing to add to that. That's beautiful. Let's bring Bishop Sheen into the room. Hey, full, full Sheen ahead. This is a beautiful day because, as I say, yesterday we got the word that Fulton Sheen, his beatification will take place the 21st of December. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but let's get his comment for today because it, it really sets the stage for what we're up against in the church today. He says, the refusal to take sides on a great moral issue is itself a decision. So being quiet right now, that's a decision. You don't want to do that. It is a silent 
acquiescence to evil. Just a silent acquiescence to evil by shutting your mouth and not speaking up for the truth. Yep. He says, the tragedy of our time is that those who still believe in honesty lack fire and conviction, while those who believe in dishonesty are full of passionate conviction. Jesse, I'm going to say it right now. This is political incorrectness. People in our church today, objectively, want to be quiet because we don't want to rock the boat. And this is what Bishop Sheen is talking about. They have no fire, no conviction. You know what they say? Oh, wherever the wind blows, that's where I'll go. I just want to be comfortable. I don't want to have anybody tell me I can't you know, do my, my, my comfortable life right now. I don't want to have anybody get in my face and, and tell me what I'm doing is wrong because there is no wrong. There is no right. It's just what I feel. And so Bishop Sheen is hitting right now our culture. And this was written 60 years ago, Jesse, but it's so apropos for today. Now, Jess, I've spent hours on the phone talking to people about the canon, the beatification of Fulton Sheen. I've got a member, Al Smith, who was on our show. Uh, he's on the board for the canonization. He can't get a ticket to go to uh, the canonization because they're putting it in a little cathedral That'll hold about 600 people. That's basically the clergy. Now, they originally were going to go to the convention hall center that holds 15,000 people. For whatever reason, I won't say because I don't know, but I have a suspicion, Jess, they want to kind of make this a quiet event. So here's what's happening, folks, at the latest, and I'll let you know more about it. We're going to get the feed off of EWTN. They're going to be there to film the Mass. We're going to put people in our chapel, take the Blessed Sacrament, put it in the sacristy, and bring people in to witness the beatification of Fulton Sheen. And unfortunately, I had gotten my, my, my hotel room last night when I knew I was going to go, but there's no reason to go, Jess, if I can't get into the church. So I just want to let everybody know that uh, you, you know EWTN will be filming it, and if you're in Southern California, we're going to have a big party, and we're going to have a special Mass of Thanksgiving after that for the beatification of Fulton Sheen. And by, by the way, Jesse, our good friend, you remember Father Andrew Apostoli. I went to Europe with him just a few years ago. He passed away just two years ago, like six months after I was with him. He was ordained by Bishop Sheen April 4th, 1967. And he was the postulator, the promoter of Fulton Sheen. And I hope and pray that he's in heaven and that he's aware of this great joy that the beatification has finally taken place. And Jess, I don't mean to be negative. It's just the facts. This whole thing was delayed for one reason, because the body was in New York, remember, for years, and the Archbishop Cardinal Dolan wouldn't release the body. And Joan Cunningham, the relative of Fulton Sheen, made a big deal about bringing the body to Peoria, and she finally won it through the secular courts, and she wrote a new book that Ignatius is going to come out with. And Jess, you and I both made endorsements on that book. I said, hey, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to know what it would have been like being with Bishop Sheen during his apostolic work. Well, now I know. So when that book comes out, you folks might want to pick that book up. But Father That's Apostoli, right. I'm sure, is, 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 is joyful in heaven, please God, when he heard the news about Fulton Sheen's beatification. Again, Fulton, uh, Fulton J. Sheen, please pray for us. Pray for us. Terry, I, I'm, I'm telling you, the modernists have been trying to suppress <laughs> this person's true. canonization for a long time. I'll just, I'm just mm-hmm. going to put it out there. And had they opened this to the public, it would have filled the entire plaza. <laughs> exactly. And they, they didn't want that. Nope. The modernists that are in charge of the church right now, they did not want to see this ocean of people come out for somebody who they would probably consider kind of a right winger. You know, kind of a conservative. And so they made it, they made it, uh, it's kind of, they, they fast-tracked this announcement in a few weeks so very few people can get a, a plane ticket to get over there. And then they made it in a very small location to make sure that it's not going to be a big uh, a yeah. big splash, so to speak. Terry, but, you know, today's the month of November. Or right. We're in the month of November. I just want to say a prayer for all our beloved dead. Exactly. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. O oh God, who's, by whose mercy the, faith, the souls of the faithful find rest, graciously grant pardon for their sins to, to all our family members, all our beloved friends that have died in, in, your, in your state of grace, and to all who sleep in Christ in a state of grace, 
so that freed from all guilt, they may share in the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And may the flights of angels lead you on your way to paradise and heavenly eternal day. And may the martyrs greet you after death's dark night and bid you enter into Zion's light. And may the choirs of angels sing to you to your rest with once poor Lazarus, now forever blessed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you want to see where, well, why we should be praying for the dead, it's found in 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 44 to 45. It says this, if, if he, Judas Maccabeus, were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them in death. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the souls of the dead. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So God greatly desires for us on earth to bring the souls in purgatory into full union with him in heaven. But in God's wisdom, he's tied the communion of saints together so that we on earth must pray for the church suffering in purgatory And as we pray and suffer for our brothers and sisters here on earth, let us never forget to pray for our brothers and sisters awaiting heaven. Well said. Jesse, I just want to mention the Spiritual Warfare Conference is coming up 111, January 11th. There's still room, and we always sell out of that. So if you want to know about it, go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And at the same time, if you subscribe to our website, I have a free gift to give you which will be given to you on December 1st. It's an early Christmas gift. All you got to do is go to Virgin Most Powerful Radio, to subscribe to our website so you, you get all information. Go to the event section of the website, and you'll hear about our Spiritual Warfare Conference. It's going to be a great one. We have great a lineup. Go check it out because I think you'll want to come. We have a large church this year, so we should have more room for more people. We'll be right back with much more on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is Jesse Romero. Join me on a pilgrimage of faith and discovery to Poland for the 100th year anniversary of the birth of St. John Paul II in May of 2020. Together we'll experience the faith, beauty, and culture of Poland and become imbibed with the spirit of John Paul II. We'll visit the town of Wadowisi, where John Paul was born, and the city of Krakow, where he was ordained and later became bishop. We'll also travel to Jasnogora and visit Our Lady of Czestochowa, And we'll have a chance to venerate the original image of the merciful Jesus at St. Faustina's convent and the city that St. Maximilian Kolbe built for the Immaculata. Finally, we'll pay a visit to Auschwitz, where St. Maximilian Kolbe was martyred. This is a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to worship and discover your own faith at places where St. John Paul II grew in his own love for our Lord. For more information or how to join this pilgrimage, visit my website at jesseromero.com. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, St. Paul says, So there abide faith, hope, and love, these three. According to St. Ignatius of Antioch, faith is the beginning and love is the end. And God is the two of them brought into unity. Then comes everything else that makes up a Christian. May God grant that we may attain all the virtues that make for authentic followers of His Son. or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org 877-LIFE-US-1 Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. 
Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Blue Collar Catholic Radio. Remember, I'm still uh, tro- want to get a bunch of you guys to come to Poland with me May 13th to the 22nd. Let's go to Catholic Disneyland. Go to my website, jesseromero.com, and let's let's go and get holy <laughs> or die trying. Exactly. Hey, Terry, uh, yeah. uh, I, I'm as a Catholic, as a, as a faithful son of the church, I'm puzzled by some of the things that I've that I've heard yeah. from the Vatican, even from the Holy Father. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said in an address to the International Association of Penal Law at the Sala Regia in the Apostolic Palace of the Vatican on Friday, he it's it's basically a condemnation of capitalism. And here's what he said quote it is no coincidence that in these times emblems and actions typical of Nazism reappear which with its persecutions against Jews, gypsies, and people of homosexual orientation, represents the negative model par excellence of a culture of waste and hatred, close quote. So, the way I see this, oh, first of all, as the Catholics, uh, there, we have what's called the perennial teachings of the church. Yep. And uh, the, the homosexual lifestyle, the practice of it, is called a mortal sin, a grave offense. In fact, God destroyed... Uh, two cities as a result of this practice. And I get it that we shouldn't hate anybody. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm all for that. That's, we don't hate anybody. We love the sin. Uh, we, we love the sinner, but hate the sin. But it seems to me, Terry, that it, it, it seems as if anybody speaks out against this, uh, he says that it, it's par excellence of a culture of waste and hatred and that concerns me as a faithful Catholic, Terry. Well, Jesse, it concerns me, too, because, uh, you know, if I was condemning adultery, would that make me a bigot or fornication? No, because it's a, it's a biblical teaching. It's a moral teaching that says this is contrary to God's law. And so when the Holy Father is talking about ecological sin and, and the catechism, we already know the catechism talks about that we don't, we shouldn't be abusing the earth. We shouldn't abuse animals. I get all that. I, I got solar panels on my roof. I, I recycle my plastic bottles. But, you know, I, I, I'm just asking the question. It seems that with, with, with the crisis in the family, when only 50% of the families have a dad at home, wouldn't it just make sense that we put more energy in the moral teachings of the church on family life than on recycling? I mean, I'm just asking the question. This make I, I got a PhD in common sense. I just think that... What he's saying here is really, uh, it, it makes me scratch my head and say, Holy Father, excuse me, uh, the church is here for salvation. The for idea, souls. yeah, for souls, salvation of souls. I mean, if somebody doesn't recycle or they don't have solar panels on their roof because they're going to save the earth, I mean, is that really the issue of the day? I just think it's the family myself, Jess. Yeah, Pope Benedict was very clear. He, he wrote back to the U.S. bishops that a lay Catholic can disagree with the Holy Father on secondary issues, on issues that don't per- pertain to the deposit of faith. And uh, the Holy Father addressed 600 delegates at the 20th International Congress of Penal Law. This is the oldest association of specialists in criminal law. you got university professors, lawyers, judges, criminal law practitioners, and one of the things that he went on to denounce was, quote, the idolatry of the market, close quote. And he blamed, quote, financial, global financial capital, close quote, for the origin of serious crimes, not only against property, but also against people and the environment. OK, and I get it that capitalism can become diabolical. Un- unbridled cartel. Capitalism. Unbridled, yeah. capitalism. unbridled capitalism that has no Christian ethic. That's right. Yeah. Look at Chapo Guzman. That's diabolical capitalism, okay? Uh, the Italian mafia, that's, uh, that's diabolical capitalism. The, uh, the Medellin cartels, that's diabolical capitalism. I totally get that. But there's, there's also, in fact, every capitalism was started by Catholic monks back in the Middle Ages. I was just going to bring that so up. So it's yes. not evil. It's something that's actually pr- was started by the Catholic Church. And he also said this, a response, it is responsible it is the responsible for organized crime. He's talking about yeah. the idolatry of the market. Sure. The over indebtedness of states and the plundering of the natural resources of our planets. He also raised what's called ecological sins. Yeah. 
And at the Amazon Synod, he says, quote, we are thinking of introducing ecological sin into the catechism. Right. He also repeated his abolition for the death penalty. And uh, and uh, one of the things that just concerns me is this, is that it seems to me as Catholics, we're moving into areas that are not the expertise of the Catholic Church when it comes to the environment, when it comes to, again, m- markets. This isn't. These are not the perennial teachings of the church. This is not the deposit of faith. The deposit of faith in Catholicism or the rule of law, the regula fide means sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the constant magisterium of the Catholic Church. So a lot of this is a bit confusing for me, Terry. I'm just a simple well, blue-collar guy. Jesse, we had uh, the Acton Institute director, Father Sariki. He wrote a book on this whole issue of of capitalism, and when it's Done right. Jesse, the facts are this, the facts. Capitalism has brought more poor people out of being poor into middle class than any other system. Now, Jess, there's no perfect system because we live in a fallen world. But I'm going to, my opinion on this is what Father taught me through his book from the Acton Institute, that if capitalism, giving people an opportunity to have their own business, giving people the opportunity to, to grow and, 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 and flourish, then that is really a great thing because what happens is when you don't give people motivation to go to work, they become lazy. That's just human nature. So I have to tell you, Jess, uh, I'm a big believer in where not unbridled capitalism, but giving a man an opportunity to start his own business or to work at, at a job and make it better and make him. And he should have a profit because guess what, Jesse, I'm going to ask you a question. How many poor people have given other people jobs? Zero. When you've got an entrepreneur type person who's got a, who who comes up with an idea to start a business and he starts employing people, I think that's a good thing, Jess. I totally agree with you, Terry. And and I'll tell you what concerns me is uh, again uh, bringing things that are not part of the deposit of faith and elevating them, maybe you know next to you know, something like abortion or uh, homosexual marriage, things that we know that are intrinsically evil yeah. and gravely disordered and, and mortally sinful, they're grave offenses. Because if they insert this ecological sin into the catechism, I mean, if I can imagine people going to confession and saying, think about that, they're going to say, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Well, and I guess if you're in uh, the Amazon Synod, you'll say, bless me, mother, for I have sinned. If they have female priests, I don't know. And they'll say, well, it's been a couple of years since my last confession. But now that the catechism has been amended, these are my sins. Well, I feel bad because I failed to prostrate before the ecological pagan Pachamama idols in the Vatican Gardens. Or I allowed myself to uh, to enter into the near occasion of sin against uh, the dogma of global warming by looking at internet websites that were not controlled by the liberal establishment. And and I'm ashamed to confess that I've fallen into sin because I'm reading other scientists that don't believe in global warming. Or or maybe you're going to confess, you know, uh, forgive me, Father, because I've fallen into the, into the sin of doubting that a one-world government can save the planet from global warming one day. Or, you know, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned because... You know, uh, I'm sorry for judging adulterers going to Holy Communion in my family. And uh, or, or or imagine this. Uh, forgive me for I've sinned. I broke up with my adulterous partner and I still went to communion without trying to reunite with my partner in an adulterous relationship. Terry, all this becomes oh, very ridiculous. ridiculous. The things that people can start confessing yeah. if this is inserted into the catechism. Or, or can you imagine, say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I, I committed the unforgivable sin i had a moment of weakness where i doubted george soros and his uh you know open borders and unlimited mass migration and oh or father forgive me for i have sinned i voted for donald trump i mean where's this going to stop at terry you know what i'm saying well, jesse i hope it never happens and i hope that through the prayers of our listeners that we pray for holy mother the church to go back to its what its its purpose and that is the salvation of souls because jesse when you were going through that litany I was getting sick. I'll be honest with you. I'm saying, get out of here. This is ridiculous. Are you kidding me? Is this microphone on? 
No, here's what I want to encourage our listeners to do, because we, we are evangelists, okay? We're not doomers, but let's talk about Holy Mother Church's needs right now for our leaders. We need to be praying hard for our Pope, for our bishops, our priests, because it's not easy out there right now because there's so much political pressure being put on. I'll give you an example. Yesterday I talked about Chick-fil-A compromising. Well, uh, I got one more story when we come back from the break that I'm going to show you a singer for the football game for the, uh, uh, the, the Dallas Cowboys. And she says, look, I'm not going to sing because it's promoting the Salvation Army and their their promoters uh, for saying that uh, same-sex marriage is wrong, that the Bible condemns it. I can't do that. Here's my point, folks. This is not the time to run away and say, Jesse, I can't handle that. I'm done. No, it's the time to get on your knees and make sacrifices and prayers because we know that our prayers have an effect on the church and right now, the church is in desperate need. Cardinal Seurat's book, I've been telling everybody to keep reading anything on Cardinal Seurat. It should give you inspiration because right now we're at a detriment, we're at a time in our church history where things are out of control. I'll be honest with you, Jess, they're out of control. So what do we do? We don't run. We pray hard. And I think that our culture is is an indication of how bad it is out there that it needs Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. It needs the perennial teachings of the church. And that's what we're going to give you here at Virgin Most Powerful. We want to help you get to heaven. I'm done, Jess. Yeah, and as as Catholics, you know, it's very important for us to remember what the church has always taught. As St. Vincent of Lorenz says, he says, what the church has taught everywhere... At all times yep. and in all places. Yep. That when Terry and I say the perennial teachings, that's St. Vincent's of Lorenz, where he says mm-hmm. the Catholic faith is what has been taught everywhere, at all times, and in every place. Terry, and again, uh, the Pope also repeated the, the, his call for the abolition of the death penalty, mm-hmm. which is another area where, where a lot of people, good people, Father George Butler. A book, you know, Ed, Ed, a uh, philosopher, wrote a book. A lot of people are saying, "Wow, this, uh, this is very confusing," based on what we see in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and two thousand years of Catholic teaching. In fact, the first pope of the Catholic Church, Saint Peter, uh, in in First Peter chapter two verse seventeen, he was killed under the orders of the Roman Emperor. But what did he say about the Roman Emperor? Okay, remember, he was crucified upside down by pagan Roman soldiers at the behest of uh, either Emperor Nero or Domitian. But he didn't speak out against the death penalty. He could have, because he wrote two letters. He said this, quote, right before he died, quote, Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. He said, honor the emperor. He had him killed. He didn't say the emperor has no authority to do what he's doing. You got it. We'll be right back with much more with the Terry and Jesse Show on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Welcome to our January 11th, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com. Click there on our website, log in your Amazon account, and when you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting 
Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Blue Collar Catholic Radio. Terry, there is uh, an ABC News anchor. Her name's Amy Roback. She was caught on a hot mic saying that her network spiked the Jeffrey Epstein bombshell. I'm just wondering if uh, if uh, if our engineer Richard, if you have a chance, Richard, if you can queue up and let me know when, if uh, you can queue up the little. Uh, it's ready. Okay, let's do it. I want you to hear Amy Roback. She told me everything. She had pictures. She had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton. We had everything. I I tried for three years to get it on to no avail and now it's all coming out and it's like these new rele- revelations and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God, we, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Brad Edwards, the attorney three years ago saying like, aunt, like we, there will come a day where we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific pedophile this country has ever known. And I had it all three years ago. Well, then I got a little concerned about why I couldn't get on. So do I think he was killed? A hundred percent. Yes, I do. Because you want he made his whole living blackmailing people. Yeah. There were a lot of men in those planes, a lot of men who visited that island, a lot of powerful men who came into that apartment. I knew immediately. <clears throat> and they made it seem as though he made that suicide attempt two weeks earlier, but his lawyers claimed that he was roughed up by his cellmate around the neck, that was all like to plant the seed. And then, that's why I really believe it. Like really believe it. Gillen Maxwell, who I had all sorts of stuff on her too. I love every. I'm like, it's so funny to hear everyone say her name now. Cause I'm like, oh my God, like I had all the, and everyone's like, who's that? Who cares? I kept getting that, who cares? Um, she knows everything. She knows, she knows, she, like, she should, she should be careful. Well, she was his like, yeah. She went out and recruited all of these girls. She should watch her back. Because if she goes, I mean, I'd have, like, security guards all around me. What you just listened to was Amy Roback. She's an ABC News anchor. She was recorded on an open mic, a hot mic, and uh, saying that her employer, ABC, basically spiked the story of Jeffrey Epstein three years ago. And she was upset about it. Because she said that she had all the data. She said this was going to be the biggest sexual scandal in the history of the world. There was names of the rich and famous. Uh, They had all the evidence. I mean, Prince Andrew's been named, Bill Clinton. uh, A a lot of rich and famous uh, that went to Epstein's private island. And uh, and they were having sexual escapades with minors. And she says ABC forced her to bury the story. All I can tell you, Terry, is follow the money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And uh, once again, Satan uh, is able to uh, to, to, to uh, spike a story that would have been the biggest story of the century. Jesse, what he did is he would bring these people into the island. He had cameras all over the place, so he filmed their immoral living he had everybody and, dirty. Exactly. And he said, look, you got to do what I want you to do, because if you don't, I'm going to show the goods. And so this was his M.O. 
And I'm telling you, Jess, uh, there's a lot of powerful people that went there, as, he, as she said. And let's just be honest with it. Who, I want to know the question. Is, it's just like, I want to know this question. An ABC president, what did he know about this? Why did they stop this? I, you know, but it seems like they're going to be like, you know, some people in the church, they don't want to answer questions about the sexual misconduct in the Catholic Church. Well, this is the same thing. The top of the ABC, he's not saying anything. And I'm I'm saddened by it, but I think you're you nailed it when you said follow the money. Yeah, and Terry, and there was a, a forensic pathologist, very famous, Dr. Michael Biden, mm-hmm. who had an interview with Fox News last week, and, yeah. and he said that Epstein's body bore telltale signs of homicide and stra- right. and, uh, and and strangulation, yeah. despite the official ruling that's that right. said that he committed suicide. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Michael Biden says no, that's not possible. Just All the, the evidence leads to strangulation. He was killed. Yep. And uh, the yeah. prosecutors alleged that the previously convicted sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein, that he paid girls as young as 14, as, uh, 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 girls as young as 14, hundreds of dollars for massages before, again, he would violate them in his New York and Palm Beach, Florida uh, residences between 2002 and 2005. And I'm glad to see, Terry, that the House Minority Leader, yeah. Kevin McCarthy, who's a Republican from your neck of the woods, California, right. he sent a letter to ABC News demanding answers regarding allegations that they buried this 2015 story about child sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein and all his friends that he invited to the island. And uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy says, quote, I'm deeply concerned that this victim, in search of justice, went to ABC News, provided information and an interview, and then ABC News chose to bury the truth. So McCarthy wrote to ABC News President James Goldston and says, what's going on? Uh, Why did you guys bury this story when you have all this evidence? For what reason? And so ABC News right now, they're under scrutiny, and that's a good thing, Terry. Yeah, and Jess, this is, again, uh, the world we live in without God. You see, there's no morals. So guess what? Anything goes. And so if you've got money, you can do anything you want. But you know what's so sad, Jesse? I'm going to be, I'm going to put it back into my own Catholic mindset. God have mercy on Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, here's a man who objectively lived a immoral, sinful, wicked life. And think about this, everybody. I'm going to say, most likely, I can't judge him. Maybe he had a conversion. It's possible, but I don't think so. That man's going to spend all eternity in hell? Think about that, Jess. See, my you, thoughts, you, exactly. You, yeah, and then here's my thought to me. Me. I could do that, Jesse, if I forgot to pray and go to the sacraments and yeah. give my life to Jesus. you die in mortal sin. I could die in mortal sin. Unconfessed mortal sin. And that could we'll be in the same in. place. So what's the message to me right now? i got to get down on my knees and pray and say the world's in a heap of trouble, and the Catholic faith has the answer to the meaning and purpose of life, and I need to proclaim that and not be worried about, oh, if I say this, someone might think I'm I'm kind of extreme. No, we have a moral obligation. What did Bishop Sheen say at the beginning of the show? He said the refusal to take sides on a great moral issue is itself a decision. So for us to be quiet about this, Jess, and say, well, we don't want to talk about that. No, we need to talk about it. It's a silent, it, it is a silent acquiescence of evil if we don't. The tragedy of our time, Bishop Sheen says, is that those who still believe in honesty lack fire and conviction, while those who believe in dishonesty are full of passionate conviction. You know what most people are going to say? Turn the station. I want to go to my ball game later this afternoon. Oh, well. But you know what? I feel bad for all those people who are living life without God because guess what? The decision that they made to do that, they're going to pay for it for all eternity, Jess. That's my take. Terry, I'll tell you, as, as Catholics, we have to really watch ourselves. Absolutely. Because St. Paul says that the two most common sins of the New Testament in Ephesians uh, 5, 5, and he also yeah. says, in, I think in Colossians 3, 5, yeah. I'll flip my Bible just to verify. Yeah. But he says that the two most common New Testament sins are sexual immorality those are lady. and idolatry. Yep, those but, are the two. Yeah, this is New Testament theology. So this is this is the top of the food That's chain right. here. I just flipped, I flipped over my Bible, Ephesians chapter 5, 
uh, verse. I said five. Is that what I said? Yeah, yeah. you said five. Yep, there it is. Yeah. A New Testament idolatry, that's it, is uh, sexual perversion and idolatry. And he also says the same thing in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Sexual perversion and idolatry. And so think about this. You could really offend God very easily by thought, word, and deed. Notice when we pray at Holy Mass and we say, I, I, I confess to you, uh, when you when you do the confidior mm-hmm. and we confess our sins, yeah. that we confess are, are the sins of thought, word, and deed. Yep. Exactly. Okay? Yep. Co- the, the, the sins of thought are a violation of the first commandment. This is this is old Catholic teaching that comes from the Council of Trent. Okay. The words of the, the, the sins of thought are a violation against God's majesty as holiness, against the, the first commandment. Uh the the sins of word are a violation against the second commandment. Okay? The second commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The sins of deed, those are violations of the third commandment when we don't give God his due honor and worship him on the seventh day and worship him throughout the week in prayer. And so when we pray that that conf- or that penitential rite mm-hmm. at Holy Mass, yeah. the penitential rite, you're saying sorry for breaking the first three commandments because those are the most important commandments. One, two, and three. I, I, you know, when you say, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my thoughts, through my words, and what I have done. Okay, so thought violates the first commandment. Uh, word violates the second commandment. Deed violates the third commandment. So when you say that penitential right every day, uh, again, you're, you're pleading God and asking him to have mercy on you for violating the most important of the Ten Commandments, one, two, and three. And that's what we're dealing with, Terry, in this whole you nailed uh, it. Epstein issue. Yeah, you nailed it. They didn't put God first. That's right. They put their passions first. Yep. They put their sexual appetites first. Yep. They didn't, they didn't put God's, uh, God's law and God's holiness and God's, uh, and God's majesty before. And uh, now people are paying the consequences. They're running away from the media and trying to hide. Who knows how, this will be, how long it will be suppressed? Uh, but all things, Terry, will come out at the end on Judgment Day anyhow. You nailed it. And Jess, thanks for that good catechesis. You see, what happens is we're not just, we're not reporters. We're evangelists. We'll give you the bad news, but we give you the solution every single time. When we come back, we're going to talk about something that Pope Benedict said about the Second Vatican Council. And also, I want to tell you about a famous singer who's threatening not to sing at a football game for the Dallas Cowboys because... One of the sponsors is a Christian group that hasn't that doesn't support the LGBT. We'll find out who that is when we come right back on the Terry and Jesse show. Hi, this is Terry Barber. I want to share with you a wonderful program called The Legacy of Love and Devotion. Well, what is it? Well, it's where you share your life and love of your Catholic faith with your family for the next century and beyond. Let's face it. Our Lord is going to call you home at some time, and how are you going to evangelize your relatives in the future? Well, by coming into my studio by a telephone call and telling your story of how you love Jesus and Mary and the church and giving information to your great-grandchildren and beyond their love for the Catholic faith. How does it work? I'm going to tell you more if you call me on my cell phone, 661-972-7872, and I'll give you all the details of how you can pass on your Catholic faith to the next generation and the following generations. It's a very unique program. I want to tell you more about it. Call me at 661-972-7872. God love you. In Luke 7, Jesus said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven her because she has been shown great love. According to St. John of the Cross, Christians should always remember that the value of their good works is not based on number and excellence. Their value is based on the love for God that prompts them to do the works. 
May we always be motivated by true love for God and not worry so much about what we do, but why we do it. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. Did you hear Jess Romero just a minute ago talking about the how do we catechize ourselves in our examination of conscience? That was excellent. Share that with your friends. I gave a little teaser before we ended the break about a singer. Uh, A Grammy-nominated singer threatened to pull out of a charity fundraiser for the Salvation Army because of the Christians group's alleged discrimination against homosexuals and transgenders. Now, this is a British singer, Ellie Coulding. She threatened Tuesday to cancel her planned performance to to kick off the Salvation Army Red Kettle annual campaign. You know that little Santa Claus that sits out by the post office? You know, yeah, it's during a halftime show. She was going to be there to do that. And so what did she do? She's saying, wait a minute. I'm going to pressure the Salvation Army to stop support, stop going against the LGBT community because I don't believe that you should do that. Well, the the Salvation Army is saying, well, wait a minute. No, wait, time out. We don't. We do not, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation or gender identity. We we serve everybody now. The Reverend Franklin Graham. Jess, I'm impressed with that guy. He's not Catholic, but you know what? He's he's always standing up for morality. Always. He never he's never quiet. <laughs> he's the son of the famed evangelist Billy Graham, stated on social media that Coulding should have been allowed to back out. Others in social media suggested that Coulding should consider donating her money to the Salvation Army rather than bowing to the LGBTQ demands. Jess, here's my point, and I'll throw it back to you. We need to stand up more than ever for Christian values. And don't be, they're they're calling them homophobic because, I mean, because I'm not scared of homos, homosexuality, Jess. I want to be biblical. I want to do what God's laws are. I want to live according to what Jesus Christ taught and his church regarding my sexuality because I want to get to heaven. It has nothing to do about being homophobic. And so I just think I want to encourage our listeners to stand up for what Jesus Christ teaches and the perennial teachings every time. Terry, this is an article that just shocked me when oh, I, yeah. I found it a f- couple of weeks ago. Yeah. It's, uh, it was the, the Pope Benedict right Emeritus. Yep, yep. He explains the council. He did this right before he resigned, yeah, and I think he's been, he's been holding this in for about 50 years. <laughs> and he finally said, you know what? I'm about to die. Let me just put it out there. Yeah. So it was a, ra- a Vatican radio address. It's been transcribed. You can get the article from uh, vmpr.org or my website, jesseromero.com. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm going to read what he says in this, in, in this uh, Vatican radio uh, address that's been translated. He said this, this is Pope Benedict Emeritus in 2013. This is right before he resigned. He said... He called Vatican to a virtual council, but let, I want you to hear him in his own words. He says, quote, There was the Council of the Fathers, the true council, but there was also the Council of the Media. Yep. It was almost a council in and of itself, and the world perceived the council through them, through the media. Yeah. So the council that immediately, effectively, got through to the people was that of the media, not that of the fathers. And meanwhile... The Council of the Fathers evolved within the faith. It was the Council of the Faith that sought the intellect and sought to understand and try to understand the signs of God at that moment that tried to meet the challenge of God in this time to find the words for today and tomorrow. Yep. So while the whole Council, as I said, 
moved within the faith, the Council of Journalists did not naturally take place within the world of faith, but within the categories of the media of today. Yep. That is outside of the faith with different hermeneutics. It was a hermeneutic of politics. Well said. He says. Pope Benedict Emeritus says the media saw the council as a political struggle, a struggle for power between different currents within the church. It was obvious that the media would take the side of whatever faction best suited their world. There were those who sought a decentralization of the church, power for the bishops, and then through the word for the people of God, the power of the people, the laity. There was this triple issue, the power of the Pope, then transferred to the power of the bishops, and then the power of all popular sovereignty. Naturally, they saw this as the part to be approved to promulgate to help. This was the case for the liturgy. There was no interest in the liturgy as an act of faith, but as a something to be made understandable, similar to a community activity, something profane. And we know that there was a trend, which was also historically based, that said, Sacredness is a pagan thing, possibly even from the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the only important thing is that Christ died outside, that is, outside the gates, that is, in the secular world. Sacredness ended up as profanity, even in worship. Worship is not worship, but an act that brings people together. Communal participation, and thus participation as activity. And these translations trivializing the idea of the council were virulent in the practice of implementing the liturgical reform. Born in a vision of the council outside of its own key vision of faith, and it was so, also in the matter of Scripture, Scripture is a book, historical, to treat historically and nothing else, and so on. So Pope Benedict ends by saying, and we know that this council of the media was accessible to all. Yep. So dominant more efficient, this council created many calamities, so many problems, so much misery. In reality, seminaries closed, convents convents closed, the liturgy was trivialized, and the true council has struggled to materialize, to be realized. The virtual council was stronger than the real council, but the real strength of the council was present and slowly It has emerged and is becoming the real power, which is also true reform, true renewal of the church. He ends by saying, it seems to me that 50 years after the council, we see how this virtual council is breaking down, getting lost, and the true council is emerging with all its spiritual strength. And it is our task in this year of faith, this was 2013, starting to work so that the true council with the power of the Holy Spirit is realized And the church is really renewed. We hope that the Lord will help us. He says, I retired in prayer. We'll always be with you. And together we will move ahead with the Lord in in certainty. The Lord is this victorious. Thank you. So he said something, Terry, that I've always, I've been thinking about this for years. You know, we use the term Vatican II was hijacked. That's that's absolutely what he's saying here. Yeah, he is. That another count, that the council of the media of modernism that jumped right in front of the actual documents of Vatican II. And, and not, that, not that, again, not that there's some things in Vatican II that make me scratch my head, specifically two documents. I mean, of course, I accept them, sure. but I'll tell you one thing. When I read the tradition of the Church, I'm saying, wait a minute, uh, there seems to be a, 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 a disjointed thought here, especially when it comes to Islam, religious liberty, ecumenism, uh, there are certain things pre-1965 which don't square with those two documents. That's a fact. How we're going to square that, that's not my business. I'll, I'll leave that to the Holy Spirit. Jesse, I just want to add one thing. Abbot Boniface Lukey, uh, in 1995, I went and sent a reporter up to interview him for three hours. He was a father of the Second Vatican Council on the liturgy. He worked with Bungini. Okay, folks, this is three hours of asking him tough questions about the liturgy. And it's a candid interview. One of the last survivors of the authors of the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council. You're going to discover the inside story of how the Council's noble ideals for liturgical reform went astray during the following disastrous years of implementation. Folks, I have to tell you, 
I, I wasn't there. Jesse was too young. He was just a little boy when this was going on. I was little. But here's my point. You want to know from the horse's mouth, Abbott Boniface tells it all about what happened with the liturgy. Because the way the, we have a little line, the way you worship is the way you believe. If you want to get this three-hour download, just call 877 877- Five two six two one five, and your mind will have much clarity after you hear what the abbot has to say about the liturgy. So call eight seven seven five two six two one five, and if you can make a little donation, that helps Virgin Most Powerful. But I'll tell you what, he's dead now. There's nobody like Abbot Boniface that was at the Second Vatican Council during the liturgical reforms. He was on the committee. So you can get it right from him. Three hours of questions on that. And I just think it's important that we know what the church's mind is when it comes to liturgical use. And I think the abbot does a great job. Call 877-526-2151. Jess, let's wrap this up. It's almost in. We're at the end of our show. Yep. Uh, let wrap it up. I just want to just uh, take everybody back to what Jesus uh, Jesus told St. Faustina in paragraph 1760 yeah. about spiritual warfare. Jesus actually uses the words mm-hmm. spiritual warfare in the diary of St. Faustina yep. in paragraph 1760. So this is not a biblical word. It's a Jesus word. He used, he used that word. He told St. Faustina, know that you're on a great stage where all heaven and earth are watching you. Fight like a knight Amen. so I can reward you do not be unduly fearful because you are not alone. That's Jesus of St. Faustina in paragraph 1760. And we're always telling you to live in a state of grace. Don't live in a state of mortal sin. I'll tell you who inspires me, Terry. Who's that? Uh, this uh, <clears throat> St. Joan of Arc. Uh, what an incredible, she was the French saint. And she was, she was killed in 1431. She was captured by the British. And she was tried by... Uh, by English British clergy. And you know what they, they, they accuse her of? They c- accuse her of the crime of heresy. Yes. That's why they sentenced her and they burned her at the stake. And these British clergy asked her, these British judges asked her if, uh, and by the way, these were Catholic bishops that tried her, English Catholic bishops, okay? They burned a saint at the stake. So in case you're wondering, you know, sometimes saying, Oh, wow, you know, can bishops make a mistake? Oops. She was asked if uh, by the judges, they said, hey, are you in a state of grace? I love this. Yeah. She's tied up by her arms on a pole, and she says <laughs> this to her accusers. I love she this. said, if I'm not in a state of grace, please, God, put me please. in it. I love it. If I am in a state of grace, please, God, keep me there. Then they turned on the fire, these British Catholic bishops, and burned her at the stake. And what did she say three times? Jesus! 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 I love it. Jace, this sets us up for what state we should be living in. What did Joan of Arc say? The state of grace. What state shouldn't we be living in? State of mortal sin. Up next, the Bible with the barbers. We're going to have some interesting things to say uh, regarding about the book of Romans. We're going to go through that, and we're going to use a lot of Scott Hahn material, so you won't want to miss it here at Virgin Most Powerful. Also, don't forget the Spiritual Warfare Conference coming up on the 11th of January. You're going to want to come. It's out in the West Coast, but it's worth the trip. Again, go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and sign up at the same time on our website, and I'll be giving you a free gift on December 1st just by doing that. I want to thank you for joining us. We're here because we want to get you to heaven. And, you know, the things that we talk about, yes, they're problems, but we always give the solutions. And it's the same one. It's Jesus Christ. May God bless you and your family. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O oh, my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. 
for thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin most powerful, pray for us.